Lindau is primarily about students and young scientists meeting Nobel laureates. This event, Turning the Tables, we're reversing that. This is an opportunity for the laureates to meet and question some students. This week, I don't know whether anyone saw, saw this, a, a prominent scientist described PhD students as serfs, which is somewhat controversial. So my question is to the panel, is your experience that you have been treated like a serf and what should the relationship between a student and a supervisor be? I'm proud to be a serf. I'm proud to be the laborer of science. <laughs> Uh, because for me, my supervisor is more delegating the things and I'm the one who is doing the research, writing the codes, writing the papers. So from this respect, from a labor respect, I believe we are the serfs, but it is a good thing. I mean, that's why I'm in science and I wouldn't give that up. You can come and work for me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> I think for a scientist it's very important to be to feel like freedom and independence. Sometimes I see people that are working many many hours but they stop to enjoy <laughs> very soon and they just give data, experiments, results but no ideas and no no happiness that's important I think. I think the interaction between the supervisor and the student has to be a very close one but there has to be a, an element of freedom to find uh, things that are interesting for you um, and be able to follow them through without the supervisor telling you it is a stupid idea. Um, it might be a stupid idea, but out of the stupid ideas come the most brilliant sort of breakthroughs. So I said, you know, it look, looks stupid to me, but do it because I know I'm stupid as well. Do any of you guys have uh, negative experiences about the fact that you're on the road so much or that you're, you're, you're not in good contact with your students? I always feel that what you're doing with a student is you're bringing them through this transition as a graduate student and as a postdoc where they're going to become independent researchers themselves and the more you can be independent the more you can give them confidence that you give them guidance but if they think they did it all themselves and they don't know why you're even their mentor then you actually did a good job because you give them confidence that they're going to be able to go forward and do the research and some, some students do that extremely well, it's very natural for them. Some students actually want their hand held and, and it's difficult when you're traveling a lot. When you're an international student, as I think you all are, what, what, what are the criteria, does, does, it, does internationality figure in your choice of, of, of the next job that you apply for? After a while you, became, you become stateless, it has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. And you become ready to move anywhere possible because you want to do the thing you want to do, but then you cannot really settle, which is not so pleasant if you're looking for a career. Some countries are a little bit behind in the infrastructure, and, uh, and uh, some of the people, very talented, um, uh, are actually brain draining their countries by not coming back. The internationality has its different sides, and Russia the same, I just visited Moscow. And and people are complaining non-stop. It's not ideal now in Russia as far as science support is going. Yeah, it's uh, completely my case. I, I moved basically because uh, in Russia I had to do my PhD and at the same time I was working as a full-time uh, teacher at school, at a state school. And of course it takes a lot of energy, these teenagers, you know, three uh, days for nine hours. And I also have a small daughter in the evenings. So the rest of like 10 hours per week I was spending for science it was not enough. <laughs> I'm from Norway. I grew up in Norway. I was a mechanical engineer for Norway. If I'd stayed in Norway, I would still be a mechanical engineer. So sometimes you have to go abroad to do something. And I know you don't seem like you like to see you. you know, I went to the science. United States because I liked MIT a lot and I thought that it will add to me a lot. And then I had to consider, you know, whether Israel will provide me with enough good enough infrastructure that I'll be able to continue, maybe not on the level of MIT, but on a good enough level. And in retrospect, it was the right decision. But uh, I understand the considerations, and they're very, very sensitive. I think the bigger question is not just going back to our native countries, but to be able to stay at one place. <laughs> when, when you need to do so many postdocs to get into the tenure position. That's because the market has become much tougher. At my time, we used to do one or three, four years and finished, and you got your first assistant professorship. 
which typically was tenure track. So if you manage, you cross the tenure barrier and then, then that's it and you're on the faculty. Nowadays, you're absolutely right. It becomes more and more difficult. Yeah. You have to wander around with many postdocs and resettle and people have families. Like, and it becomes difficult to the spouse. Yes, we realize. What are you guys most concerned about right now? So from, from buyers, we're hearing he's concerned about how is he going to land and build a life because he's ready to, to build the rest of his life. He's found the scientific opportunity. Now he wants to find the life opportunity. Is that, is that the most serious concern you guys have? It's an, I, I'd say my biggest concern probably has to do outside of science and those who have a lot of influence on science, politicians. And I, I think that we should have more politicians who have been scientists before. Does anyone here have the nerve to consider a career in politics? <laughs> <laughs> I have considered a career in politics, but I have also stopped considering a career in politics. <laughs> Good why, why? It's not like science. There is no search for truth. It's actually kind of a search for the best, most saleable lie, and I don't like that as much. I'm not very good at lying. That's a beautiful way of putting yeah. it. Scientific method can be used. Politics can be done because there is some kind of a reality. If you're concerned about people and if you're convinced that the cause is this and that because of this data, then I think it could be done. It's well, it is necessary. There's no, there's no doubt that it's a use society does need to have some people interacting. The problem is the interface between, say, the philosophy that really is based on evidence. And we see that specifically in the case of, say, uh, climate change, where there's this massive political backlash against the scientific community because they just do not understand how science works. In, in democratic societies, the politicians are, are elected based on what they say, and they're saying what people want to hear. If you, if you put a scientist into politics and, and you stood up there and said, we're all doomed, you know, uh, climate change is going to cause that, he won't get elected. The problem is encapsulated by Truman, who was responsible for dropping the bomb on Hiroshima. And he said, give me a one-armed scientist. Why is that? And they can't say, on the other hand. <laughs> and it encapsulates the problem because no one has used the products of science more effectively, if you wish, than Truman. Yeah. That was a very, that was something that the scientific community really had tremendous deep problems with because they didn't realize it wasn't built for that particular purpose, or what they didn't work for that particular purpose. Well, I wanted to say that uh, I think the interaction of science and politics is really important. Uh, I've taken a little bit of my Nobel money to uh, start uh, summer internships for uh, physics students to work with the politicians that we have in Washington. And we have three legislators who are physicists, actually. And so I think it's possible, although some people doubt it, that uh, a scientist could be a good politician. I think some of them are. And I actually chipped in to help elect one of those physicists. So I thought, this is really cool. He worked at uh, Fermilab, and he's a good scientist. So I think, uh, as a point, uh, I advise people not to give up too easily. <laughs> now, I perfectly well think I'm not a good politician. I'm, I'm saying that I don't have the right personality. Uh, but some people do. And I want uh, people to take this as a serious possibility. I think we shouldn't burden them too much. I mean, we heard that they are really involved in basic problems of where to settle, how to develop their career. I think that the only thing is, one, not to be cynical, because the politicians are important. They represent the public. They are elected by the public. And we are living in the public. We are living on the taxpayers' money at the end of the day. And the politicians decide about the fate of science and higher education. So the idea is really not to be cynical. Doesn't mean that we have to be involved in politics. And the idea for you, I think, is to be aware about the interfaces. I don't think that you really, we need to ask you now to go to politics when you haven't even graduated. And you have to think of your postdoc and your position and the grants and, and furthermore. But to be aware that there are many interfaces between science and society. So being aware of it, putting it in the back of your minds, I think that this is the right way to do it. I think the easiest way for us to affect politics is to communicate and to educate, right? Because that is the easiest way for individuals to influence their politicians and pressure them to make changes. Well, a couple of years ago, there were, um, in Italy, changes the government. The government started a series of cuts 
on uh, budgets to the universities. Uh, basically, the students uh, with the professors and the uh, decided to give a series of uh, lessons uh, in the squares of the city. We were in front of uh, the Dome of Milan and there were a lot of people that stopped there just to listening to what we were doing. But uh, it was very, very nice to see that uh, when we move away from uh, our buildings, when we go in, uh, in the middle of the squares, uh, people is interested in. We had a similar experience yesterday with the people of Lindau. There were a lot of families and they started to interact with them, uh, to speak with them and, uh, and you can see that they were happy to, to talk with us. We started to speak about science and then we, we move on speaking about our lives, our uh, cultures and so on. And, uh, I mean, uh, it was a dream yesterday. <laughs> yeah. On that note, thank you all for attending, thank you to the students and thank you to the laureates.